Greetings, my name is Michael Teixeira, and it is a pleasure for me to present this course uh, at the Academy meeting of the American Academy of Otolaryngology 2020. The, our topic today is procedures for pain, nerve blocks and Botox for the otolaryngologist. <clears throat> I'm Michael Teixeira. I am a neurotologist in Wilmington, Delaware, and Frederick Godley is an otolaryngologist in Providence, Rhode Island. And the two of us have a keen interest in migraine. And in migraine management, we have become familiar with the use of Botox and with the nerve, use of nerve blocks, which has not only served our migraine patients, but has facilitated our ability to evaluate and treat patients with atypical facial pain who present to us. And we realized that there was almost no emphasis on the use of nerve blocks uh, in our training and certainly no use of Botox. So uh, we um, felt that it would be an interesting and useful addition for our colleagues to get an introduction to the use of Botox and nerve blocks in general practice. Let's see um, how um, helpful this may be just by looking at a couple of cases. Here's a 48-year-old female. She has two years of chronic right maxillary pain, no history of trauma. She has a, an episode of real sinusitis with infected drainage every uh, couple of years. It resolves with antibiotics. And a CT examination uh, was performed because of this. And she has a cyst in the floor of the opposite maxillary sinus. Um, this is likely an incidental finding. Uh, her septum is mildly deviated to the right side. She has a paradoxical middle turbinate on the left. She doesn't seem to have any seasonal variation to her pain, um, uh, but it is distinctly worse with weather change and stress. Um, she actually went to a dentist because of this persistent pain and had a second molar extracted. Uh, which uh, lamentably had no benefit, and she was scheduled for a second extraction um, in two weeks at the time that I saw her. Uh, she has a history of menstrual migraine and but now is in mid-menopause. Uh, um, so when we think about uh, treatment for her, um, we, um, in, in my mind, I felt that migraine was an important part of her history that she was having. Um, uh, variation of her symptoms with known migraine triggers such as weather change and stress and I told her to cancel the extraction and we treated her with migraine preventive medications which were actually very effective at stopping her pain and saving her tooth. Let's look at another case. <clears throat> um, I think we've all seen a case like this as well. It's a 55 year old female with a history of mid-face trauma uh, from 20 years ago. She um, has pain that is constant in the left temple and cheek. It's unremitting and rather severe. Uh, she has avoided uh, uh, taking chronic pain medications because uh, she didn't want to become uh, addicted to them. Uh, she has uh, not tolerated very many sodium channel blockers and she's failed all the usual ones. And she's currently on gabapentin at a low dose probably because she had such intolerance to the other medications. Uh, but she's, not, she's getting just a little bit of benefit. She thinks that her pain is down to seven out of, uh, instead of eight <clears throat> on the gabapentin. She doesn't have a history of migraine. <clears throat> we performed a nerve block on her and we uh, did an infraorbital nerve block, which was successful, but there was still areas outside of the area of anesthesia, which were painful over the malar eminence. So we did a zygomatic facial nerve block, which again was successful, but there was residual pain in the temple. Uh, we added a zygomatic temporal block, uh, which eliminated all of her pain. Uh, the anesthesia from the lidocaine we injected uh, was gone in two hours, but she reported that her pain was gone in 24, uh, for, for an entire 24 hours. And when it returned, it wasn't at seven out of 10 intensity, it was at four out of 10 uh, at the time that we saw her um, about uh, eight days later. <clears throat> so in her case, uh, we decided to repeat the block weekly uh, to decrease central sensitization in the uh, nuclei uh, was, uh, that the, uh, of the nerve 
And uh, we also used a longer acting medication than lidocaine using bipuvacaine. And we also, because her gabapentin dose was so low, we titrated the dose up. And she's done very well and required intermittent nerve blocks to maintain this much lower level of pain and improved quality of life. Uh, so this is something that's simple and easy to do at her appointments, and uh, she's been gr very grateful. I think we all have patients like this. So today, we're going to review a little bit of the neuroanatomy of head and face pain to become um, more acutely aware of all of the nerve branches which we might want to uh, anesthetize when we're trying to uh, investigate the source of pain in patients. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, we're going to review some physiologic mechanisms of head and face pain and uh, talk about medical treatments and even surgical treatments of head and face pain, even those that are um, a little controversial. So uh, migraine, that's going, to, we're so, uh, that's going to cover migraine management, nerve blocks, Botox, and uh, peripheral surgery. Now, uh, what ties all of this together is really the trigeminal cervical nucleus complex, uh, the trigeminal nucleus caudalis. It is the trigeminal nucleus, which is the nucleus of the trigeminal nerve, which is actually fused with the um, uh, a nucleus of the, the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal nerve from which the cervical nerve roots emanate. And uh, when we look at all of the peripheral connections of this um, uh, complex, it all seems to function as a single nerve in some respects. And we'll talk about that more. Uh, so the trigeminal nerve, of course, has a um, nucleus in the brainstem, a ganglion, the Gasserian ganglion, and then three major divisions, uh, you know, the ophthalmic division, the maxillary division, and the mandibular division, with which we are all um, very familiar. The, um, uh, but coming off of the uh, trigeminal cervical nuclear complex is the cervical plexus. And these are the nerve roots of C2, C3, and C4, which give rise to the greater auricular nerve, the lesser occipital nerve, the transverse cervical nerves, and the supra, supraclavicularis, um, in which anesthetize the, anesthetizes the anterior neck and side of the head. The um, occiput and posterior scalp is innervated by the occipital nerves, which um, are uh, direct extensions outside of the plexus uh, from C2 with some contributions uh, of C3 to the lesser occipital nerve. So we have the greater occipital nerve here and the uh, lesser occipital nerve more lateral behind the mastoid tip and then uh, the third occipital nerve closer to the midline. And, and make note here of the nuchal ridge and of the occipital tuberosity. These are important landmarks later uh, for injections of both an anesthetics and Botox. So <clears throat> let's look at all of those nerves, the occipital nerves, the cervical plexus, and the branches of the trigeminal nerve, and look at the sensory domains in the head and neck. Of course, V1 covers the bridge of the nose, the orbit, the temporal parietal area, and, uh, all, and, and the scalp, all the way to the vertex. And the um, maxillary nerve um, innervates the side of the bridge of the nose, the nasal tip, the upper lip, the maxilla, and the zygomatic prominence, and the frontotemporal area. And this is the frontotemporal, or the, the zygomaticotemporal nerve, uh, which was anesthetized in that second patient presentation, and which finally eliminated all of her pain. The maxillary division innervates the mandible, and the skin in front of the ear up into the uh, temporal fossa and over the temporal fossa. The uh, cervical plexus uh, gives contribution to the, to the anterior neck, lateral neck, and the uh, portions of the auricle. And the occipital nerves uh, con contribute to the auricle and posterior neck and scalp all the way until it meets the domain of V1 near the vertex. The auricle itself has various um, uh, innervation that comes from the cervical plexus, from the um, greater, lesser occipital nerve, 
but also from, trigem from uh, cranial nerves, such as the facial nerve here and the contra bowl, the vagus nerve innervates the ear canal. We're all familiar with the stimulation we get uh, of, of coughing when we clean people's ears. And in front of the ear is the trigeminal nerve, the, uh, innervated by the auricular temporal nerve. The ear canal is, ten, is a cranial nerve 10, and the lateral surface of the tympanic membrane is innervated by the 10th nerve with some contributions from uh, V3. But the medial surface of the tympanic membrane is innervated by the glossopharyngeal nerve, uh, as is the middle ear mucosa. The labyrinth uh, is, of course, innervated. It's a sensory organ and is innervated by the cochlear nerve and the vestibular nerves, the superior and inferior vestibular nerves. But from a sensory standpoint, uh, the blood vessels, the vasa nervorum and the blood vessels of the labyrinth are innervated by branches of V1. Now these are unmyelinated uh, C fibers. They are capable of secreting inflammatory peptides, and they may be responsible for the sense of oral fullness and even otalgia that pa patients have. We all see them. Uh, they have negative workups, but it's, these are, this is pain they're having in V1 from the, directly from the labyrinth. The oral cavity is, uh, of course, innervated by um, the second and third divisions of the trigeminal nerve up to the circumvallate papillae and the fauces. Um, so the maxillary portions of the oral cavity are innervated by branches of V2, the mandibular um, divisions, uh, the, the mandibular portions and the floor of the oral cavity and tongue are innervated by branches of V3. But at the, in the pharynx, delineated by the circumvallate papillae and the, fauce, and the fauces, are um, innervated by the ninth and 10th nerves from a sensory standpoint. Now, the TMJ is something we are always aware of, and uh, there are numerous branches, but all of from V3, which innervate the temporomandibular joint. So the nerves in particular are the deep temporal nerve, um, and articula special articular branches, but the auricular branches of the auricular temporal nerve and the masseteric nerve which innervate the temporomandibular joint and the ligaments in the complex here, uh, which is a source of uh, pain for many patients. The nose and sinuses have um, a various distribution of innervation between V1 and V2. V1 um, uh, is the anterior portion of the lateral nasal wall, the uh, ethmoid sinuses and uh, sphenoid sinus, V2, um, uh, innervates the mid lateral nasal wall and uh, upper nasopharynx, and uh, the septum is divided between V1 and V2. We should remember that every blood vessel in the head and neck, and in fact in the entire body, is innervated, and every blood vessel is indeed sensitive. They are innervated by C fibers, and the head and neck are no exception. So every blood vessel is a source of, of potential pain. We all are familiar with migraine in which the dilation and contraction of blood vessels or the sensitiz sensitization of blood vessels um, in the head causes pain, uh, which we know is a migraine headache. Um, when we uh, think about the, the innervation of the uh, intracranial structures, we know that the brain itself is not sensate, but that the dura and the vascular structures, the large and medium-sized arteries and venous sinuses are very sensitive. And a live surgery, uh, awake surgery experiments in the 1940s established sensory domains in the distribution of um, uh, V1 and even in the cervical plexus. Um, in the posterior fossa in these patients. So these are patterns of referred pain uh, from uh, patients being stimulated intracranially that are exactly in the distributions we associate with migraine headaches. Now, why do we get pain? Well, let's, uh, I think one of the most uh, simple ways to think about this is that we have um, uh, stimulation of uh, not just trigeminal outflow, 
uh, but uh, uh, outflow of any nerve that causes some extravasation of plasma proteins uh, in the periphery. In migraine, we look at a dural vessel and we know it's innervated by in, uh, C fibers, which have inflammatory peptides within it. And those inflammatory peptides secrete a toxic soup of inflammatory mediators. And these are actually sensitize the vessels to cause pain. They also sensitize free nerve endings and other tissues other than blood vessels in other parts of the body. So this is a model from the head and migraine, but that is um, valid for the, much of the rest of the body as well. And so when we, um, uh, so what, is, what are these inflammatory mediators and where are they actually acting? They are acting on vanilloid receptors. Um, uh, these receptors are calcium channels and they're present on unmyelinated sensory fibers. Uh, they're on blood vessels, but they're also on free nerve endings. And these uh, channels are responsive to heat, to acidity, and even to mechanical force and deformation. And they um, have uh, uh, contain within them a variety of inflammatory mediators such as substance P, VIP, neuropeptide Y, and most, perhaps most importantly in migraine patients, CGRP, calcitonin, calcitonin gene-related peptide. Um, and when these are secreted into the periphery, we actually get a stimulation of C fibers and afferent stimulation of pain um, uh, toward the central nervous system. Uh, these inflammatory mediators are so strong that if we overstimulate an area, we actually get a partial denervation, uh, as if these fibers are a small pancreas. That's the basis of capsaicin patches. It causes the fibers to unload all their inflammatory mediators, and then the pain fibers themselves get burned out, at least temporarily. So why does pain occur? Well, it can occur because where we have more stimulation at the periphery uh, to on the nociceptors themselves. You can have a neuroma, uh, like uh, this would be a, a pathologic neuroma after transection of a nerve uh, that is unusually and pathologically sensitive to pressure. Um, but there also could be compression of a nerve. All nerves pass through tight spots and neural uh, and bony foramina and uh, nerves um, can, uh, these uh, uh, pathways and conduits can be distorted by scarring from trauma and, and also become consequential if nerves themselves change their size because tissues become edematous uh, in association with chronic disease states. Um, patients can have neuropathies and in, um, which alt in which the function of a nerve is fundamentally altered. And the most common neuropathy in the head and neck, of course, is migraine. Patients also can have pain because the central um, nuclei, which serve sensory nerves, uh, become sensitized. Their activity becomes abnormally upregulated so that pain is unusually uh, it, it, um, the pain thresholds fall and uh, uh, pain from even innocuous stimuli may be um, uh, intolerable. So let's look at a fundamental pain pathway model and we would say we have a nociceptors and a stimulus in the periphery. We have a ganglion <clears throat> of a sensory bipolar neuron. Uh, one end goes to the periphery and the other end goes to the central nervous system and that um, when we increase nociceptor activity, well, pain in the cortex also increases, as does our perception of pain. This is rather basic. For head and face pain, uh, the, the um, sensory uh, nucleus is actually uh, the trigeminal nucleus caudalis, the trigeminal cervical complex. Um, so um, if we, of course, use a block and we block uh, peripheral activity and then stimulate uh, no susceptors or attempt to, then there is no pain going to the periphery. So this is a simple model of pain. But um, there are things that happen to nerves and one of the most common is compression. And when we have compression, um, there can be spontaneous activity that is pathologic that sends signals 
to the central nervous system at rest, causing pain from the compression site. But there can be anti-dromic uh, peripheral um, uh, firing uh, back to the um, uh, nerve endings, which can cause peripheral release of inflammatory peptides. Um, and um, that actually, that secretion may actually change the threshold of nociceptors which are involved. Another thing that happens with, the, um, with compression is effaptic transmission. Now, effaptic transmission is a, a phenomena in which there is spread of excitation from a, um, a peripheral nerve. And as it comes to the point of excitation, there is lateral spread of the impulse to adjacent fibers so that there is symptom amplification uh, uh, in, uh, that is interpreted as much greater pain than actually existed based on the stimulus uh, in the CNS. And of course, if we hyperventilate, then we change the uh, calcium ion balance because of our metabolic uh, alkalosis that is induced and we enhance effaptic transmission. And this is the basis of hyperventilation nystagmus in uh, uh, when we uh, look for nystagmus uh, for an acoustic neuroma with the vestibular nerve, hyperventilation really, um, unmasks the um, increased activity caused by compression of the nerve fibers. So um, in some patients, we could block the periphery with a local anesthetic and the finger is totally numb, but the pain and is not, and the central nervous system is not responsive to, um, to pricking or poking, but the patient has persistent activity and of pain, a perception of pain, because pain is being generated either at a point of compression, in this case, a carpal tunnel, or if pain has been present for a long time, there can be reorganization at the sensory ganglion uh, so that um, uh, pain signals are upregulated and uh, so either of these um, sites can be sources of persistent pain and both in the afferent direction, but also uh, can create efferent signals as mentioned um, so that uh, in the normal state that even though uh, that, that, that there is even actually changed sensation uh, from normal at the uh, per most peripheral sites. So let's look at a phenomena of convergence, which can amplify signals. Almost every nerve that we know is an arborization of um, branches and that converge as they come toward the central nervous system. And when we have many nerves have a visceral branch and a somatic branch, and uh, when uh, signals come simultaneously from both, uh, at the point of convergence, there can be some amplification of a signal. That is convergence. And uh, we've demonstrated that um, in migraine, uh, there is a convergence of uh, dural sensitive pain fibers uh, and uh, uh, light sensitive fibers from the olfactory system. And those, this convergence results in a increased pain with light. So if we um, uh, turn on the lights, the pain, uh, the rate of firing of the dural sensitive neurons actually increases. And uh, this kind of convergence phenomena has been witnessed in many different parts of the nervous system and um, uh, must be um, acknowledged when we consider our patients who have uh, increased pain and chronic pain. So what we can do is uh, block the accessible somatic branch of the nerve and by eliminating its input and the convergence effect, uh, the pain may drop below the pain threshold and effectively decrease pain even though uh, the visceral branch continues to have a pain signal coming from it. Now this kind of a uh, phenomena could lead to an inaccurate assumption that the, all the pain is coming from the somatic branch, when in fact it could be coming from the visceral branch as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, uh, the problems of interpreting these uh, nerve blocks uh, in a minute. So um, you know, convergence, the convergence phenomena also um, results in uh, referred pain. So uh, 
we um, may have um, a convergence here, even with a neuron that has only a resting firing rate, not a pathologic pain level firing rate. But this convergence is interpreted uh, in the central nervous system as bigger than it is and, in, and misinterpreted as possibly originating from the somatic branch. So if this is the dura, where we're having migraine, direct migraine pain, uh, we may feel it in the forehead, the skin of the forehead, uh, because of this convergence amplification and referred pain. So we're not any strangers as otolaryngologists to referred pain um, from uh, distal sites or different sites that are um, innervated by the same nerve. So um, sometimes in this situation, even elimination of the resting firing rate of a healthy branch is enough to decrease and eliminate the convergence amplification and result in complete pain relief. And this is a, an effect which we can leverage um, using uh, nerve blocks in the office. We can leverage that for the benefit of our patients. Now, if we uh, stimulate a system for long enough, then the central neuroanatomy will reorganize. And in fact, uh, we know from the functional imaging studies that we can uh, uh, very accurately predict the side of migraine pain during an episode uh, by looking for increased metabolic activity in the dorsolateral pons, that is the trigeminal cervical complex in a patient. So this um, results in a lowered pain threshold and even the pain threshold can go down so low that uh, even normal touch can result in pain. We call this allodynia. Patients can't comb their hair, uh, for example. Uh, some patients can have pain because after a nerve injury, uh, axon sprouting becomes disorganized and forms a neuroma. And uh, this neuroma can become exquisitely sensitive to pressure sending um, uh, pain to the central nervous system. And uh, a block, of course, eliminates it. So the way this is traditionally treated is to excise the neuroma and then to embed the stump in muscle. And we'll see how that's done at the end of the presentation. So when we um, uh, think about neuropathy uh, we, in the head and neck, we should think about migraine. And migraine is an, ex is an extraordinarily prevalent disease. It affects 13% uh, of the population in the United States and uh, about 11.5% worldwide based on the best epidemiologic studies. And migraine is a complex process that is an intermingling of symptoms that originate from the cortex, from the blood vessels of the dura and uh, brain, and from increased activity in various combinations of the brainstem nuclei. Um, and uh, this is uh, the, the nerves that are affected by the migraine neuropathy are triggerable. And, um, and it seems that uh, pain can radiate anywhere in the head and neck, anywhere in the head and neck, uh, because all of the head and neck are served by the trigeminocervical complex. Now let's talk about nerve blocks. A nerve block basically can downregulate pain, but when we, as in this example, innervate a, a block, the infraorbital nerve, um, pain could continue um, from a direct activity within the sinus from a compression uh, through a fracture, an old healed fracture through the maxilla, from increased uh, activity and, and reorganization in the sensory um, uh, nucleus or in the uh, sensory nucleus in the brainstem. Um, so this is the ganglion and this is the nucleus. So we have to interpret with caution. So we use nerve blockade because uh, blocking a nerve can provide immediate relief of chronic pain for a patient. And repeated blockade actually can decrease chronic pain levels in some individuals, but we never can predict ahead of time who that individual is. So we have to do trials. The intervals vary. Some people have individual protocols where they inject weekly for eight weeks or every two weeks or monthly or quarterly, or the patients just come when they need it. 
Um, but um, uh, in patients who have recurrent migraine headache, uh, some patients get extraordinary and uh, long lasting relief um, uh, with uh, recurrent nerve blocks. And nerve blocks can also be used in a different way to break the cycle of continuous symptom and allow a patient with chronic headache to transmission, transition to having intermittent headaches. And that's a big deal for a lot of patients because intermittent he when you have intermittent symptoms, then the um, preventive medications can work better during that period when pain is not actually present, when inflammatory mediators are not actively being pumped out around blood vessels and stimulating pain even more which is felt even more severely by the sensitized central system. Um, in many patients, if blocks aren't successful, uh, or if a block is successful, but it doesn't last uh, long enough, we can see if we can make the treatment workable by adding Kenalog. And this uh, assumes that there is some inflammation um, that is uh, the cause of the uh, peripheral stimulation. So in some patients, this addition works well, and in others, it doesn't seem to have any effect. Now, the, when we think about uh, neurologic pain, we think about a very simple model as we've gone over. Um, and we assume, we have some assumptions. First, that the pathology causing the pain is located in an exact peripheral location, like that pin going into the finger. Second, that the um, local anesthetic totally abolishes the sensory function of the nerves that we want. And third, that um, uh, the pain relief is attributable to solely to the block of that uh, afferent neural pathway. But as we're gonna see, all of these assumptions are wrong. And uh, so we have to be careful about how we interpret. We can help with nerve blocks, but we, can't always draw strong conclusions about what to do next. Uh, so we have to be careful about uh, destructive uh, procedures uh, based on our use of nerve blocks um, because the anatomy and physiology is complex. Um, we do know that uh, uh, we can use them to try to downregulate and decrease the central uh, sensitization in some patients and um, that nerve blocks uh, can be used effectively for headache prophylaxis, especially um, occipital and frontal nerve blocks. And once we know uh, where the pain is manifesting, often that is uh, the most effective place to target. So um, uh, the analgesia, as mentioned in our, one of our cases, uh, may last just the duration of the injectable, which we use either lidocaine or bipubicane or lysosomal bound bipubicane, which lasts days. Um, but, um, but often the result of a blockade when, it, when the anesthesia wears off and the pain is still decreased, that tells us that we have probably downregulated some central sensitization. And um, that it may take days for the peripheral generator of pain to commence and build up enough um, tone to reestablish the perception of pain. Um, sometimes a patient will have a nerve block and they say, look, it was great. I had no pain for seven hours after you put that Marcaine or Bipubicaine in me. Uh, but when the pain came back, it was worse than it had ever been. And that's because the essential system was looking for the pain and become hypersensitive to the remaining afferent inputs. And uh, usually, fortunately, those patients are few and uh, they usually won't allow you to um, re-inject them. Um, and, and sometimes when we permanently denervate by, uh, and I'm not advocating for alcohol, um, uh, uh, denervation or cryoablation of nerves or even avulsion of nerves, um, although we're going to look at the surgical approaches uh, for some of those procedures. Uh, but uh, there is always that small possibility that your attempt to eliminate a peripheral input results in a worsening of pain. So let's look at the uh, one of the easiest blocks to do, and that's a sphenopalatine ganglion block. Um, uh, the sphenopalatine ganglion uh, resides in the back of the nose, 
Um, it's here. It is the largest collection of cell bodies outside of the central nervous system. These are the cell bodies of the parasympathetic nerves, which innervate all of the intracranial blood vessels. So all of the vessels on the cortex, all of the vessels in the brainstem, all of the vessels in the dura, and <clears throat> also in the maxilla. So when we um, anesthetize them, uh, we can get a rather profound effect. And uh, you can uh, anesthetize this with lidocaine in the office and patients will experience within five minutes a complete relief of headache, even if the headache is in their occiput or down as low as their shoulders you know, in the trapezius muscles. And yes, people do feel their headaches sometimes in their neck only or in their trapezius muscles only. So the way we do this is um, simply to anesthetize the sphenopalatine branches. You don't need to inject the um, submucosal tissues with lidocaine, although that is undoubtedly very effective. It's just more difficult to do. Um, there is, um, a, there are, you can do this endoscopically by uh, looking for the area, but I prefer to do it blindly because it doesn't require any um, particular special equipment. The patient is supine. I use a 1.25 um, uh, inch angiocath inserted just up under the dorsum of the nose through the nasal valve. This is not an angiocath. This is a special $75 catheter uh, that is um, designed to do this, but there's no reason to spend $75 instead of a quarter for this equipment. Um, so uh, this was designed to be marketed to people who are procedure and injury averse, that is to say neurologists and general practitioners, not it was not designed to be sent, uh, sold to otolaryngologists uh, who know their way around the nose. So if we drip um, over uh, down the frontal recess and over the lateral surface of the middle turbinate, the medication will anesthetize the area of the sphenoethmoid recess. And um, you do both sides, they lie supine for two to five minutes um, and they will get an immediate relief. And you can repeat it frequently. In fact, I send patients home if they respond with 4% lidocaine in a Flonase spray bottle, which is a metered spray bottle, 0.1 uh, cc per spray. And they do two sprays on each side and repeat it if there's no response in five minutes. And they do this at home and with safely with no toxicity. Um, you can also put a, um, a swab with lidocaine or marcaine on, on the tissue, and you can do it by visualizing with an endoscope if you prefer. Uh, if we put temperature strips on the cheek, you'll know that you're not just anesthetizing branches of the second division of the trigeminal nerve, that you're actually doing a parasympathetic denervation because um, of a decrease in in uh, temperature and pallor on the, on the cheek. So um, injection is really not necessary, although you could inject the greater palatine foramen or the pterygomaxillary fissure, but that's not something we're going to um, emphasize in this course. We'll look at the greater palatine foramen injection briefly. So V1, 2, and 3 each have their primary foramina. And uh, uh, just as internally they have their um, foramen uh, ovale and foramen uh, rotundum. Uh, outside, the, the V1 ex, uh, exits through the supraorbital foramen, V2 through the infraorbital foramen, and V3 through the mental foramen. But um, we often want to um, uh, uh, capture them and block them more proximal, especially V2. So uh, the, V2, the V1 branches are um, anesthetized directly. The supraorbital nerve can be identified easily by palpation of the supraorbital notch. And then the syringe is used to put 0.75 cc's of uh, injectate, uh, protecting the orbit with the thumb. Uh, you don't have to get in the notch for this to be effective, but you need to infiltrate the tissues uh, just as the nerve is um, exiting uh, to block the entire area. And you'll know because the anesthesia will extend all the way up uh, the frontal um, area. 
and the suprotrochlear nerve is injected second. You do it second so it doesn't, so the injection doesn't interfere with the palpation of the notch. We use a 30 gauge needle and we massage the tissues to get the, um, if there is no immediate block uh, to get the injectate to spread. The infraorbital nerve is injected directly with um, one cc of uh, material and it can, it can be injected directly through the skin or uh, above the first molar directly in the gingival buccal sulcus, which is more comfortable for many individuals. And so uh, this is uh, the way we do it. And uh, you can palpate uh, the foramen in some individuals and this is the gingival buccal sulcus incision. So um, one area that I want to pay attention to is injecting the malar eminence. There is a small foramina in the malar eminence, which is the exit of the zygomaticofacial nerve. And uh, it may be one foramen or four. So if you inject this area, you have to spread the injection out and you can get some, um, have some residual numbness after a V to block at the infraorbital foramen and then you can get it by injecting over the malar eminence. And as in the example, the patient, we did block this second and then there was still pain in the temple and we injected um, the um, zygomaticotemporal branch separately and finally eliminated all of the pain. So here is the zygomaticofacial foramen and here's the zygomatical temporal foramen in the base of the temporal fossa. Now you don't have to get it down there. You can get it on, uh, in the soft tissues just lateral to the temporalis muscle where it emerges from the muscle. So if you wanted to do a V2 trunk block, like say you were gonna do some um, a, a maxillectomy or something, you're working in the third world and you needed to really uh, block a patient uh, thoroughly, uh, then you could, uh, there are two ways to get to it. You can palpate the greater uh, palatine foramen, uh, medial to the um, uh, molar teeth. And uh, this is easy to hit because it is a, a funnel shaped foramen and uh, you go two and a half centimeters deep and inject. The, um, but you can use what's called a high tuberosity approach, which goes behind, around the maxillary tuberosity behind the maxilla uh, to get to the same area. The mental nerve is the most distal branch of V3, but we should think about it more proximal. The, um, uh, you can block the, the V3 trunk by going directly through the coronade notch, directly from lateral to medial, and at a depth of about three and a half uh, centimeters, you'll, um, you will um, encounter the pterygoid plate. And then you withdraw the needle, move it one centimeter more posterior to get into the main trunk of the nerve. You have to put three, about three cc's into this area to block this large and thickly invested nerve. Uh, you will not injure the nerve if you um, uh, inject it directly with the needle. Uh, the fascicles can move away from the tip of the needle. Um, and this is well known, especially for back injections where the nerves are often directly injected. There's no way to avoid it, um, at least in some cases. Um, we, um, of course, aspirate before injecting. The V3 um, uh, has three main branches, the auricular temporal branch, which comes cutaneous and innervates the uh, TMJ and then the inferior alveolar nerve, and then the lingual nerve, which um, innervates the floor of the mouth and the uh, side of the anterior tongue. So these, uh, uh, and the inferior alveolar nerve in turn has branches. Uh, it has the, uh, um, uh, the inferior alveolar nerve, which serves the teeth and uh, becomes the mental nerve and the buccal nerve, which ascends in front of the ramus of the mandible and innervates the lateral uh, gingival buccal sulcus, lateral to the second and third molar teeth. So here's where you palpate the ramus of the mandible and go medial to it to inject the inferior alveolar nerve. And uh, if you wanted to inject the lingual nerve, if you were doing um, surgery in a situation where you needed complete anesthesia, and then if you wanted to get the buccal branch, 
you would uh, feel for the front surface of the ramus of the mandible uh, to inject. And uh, the mental nerve block uh, is uh, done um, down uh, just below the first molar tooth, uh, not in front of below the canine, um, as many believe. And if you're going to um, in, inject the superior gingiva, there is a there are two main branches: the posterior superior and the anterior superior alveolar nerves. And then the nasopalatine nerve exits through the incisor foramen and innervates the anterior um, uh, palate. Uh, the, we talked about the innervation of the auricle and uh, you can circumferentially block the auricle. It's the anterior injection which involve, which blocks both V3 and 10. Let's talk about Botox for just a moment. Uh, Botox has been established as an effective treatment for chronic migraine. Um, it was, its use, utility was um, established in a phase three preempt trial, which preempt stands for Research Evaluating Migraine Prophylaxis Therapy. Uh, 155 units is injected in five unit aliquots in 31 sites every three months. It's expensive, um, but uh, now we have uh, other expensive treatments like C CGRP drugs, but it is uniquely effective and is only used in patients with migraine who have had um, failures of many different uh, preventive medications. Now, uh, these were thought initially to target only acetylcholine receptors and uh, their utility was identified in patients who were having forehead injections for uh, uh, cosmesis. Uh, but now we know that uh, there is inhibition of CGRP secretion in whatever tissue it's injected in, whether it's muscular tissue or not. So now we inject it in any tissue that's involved. These are the injection sites. We inject in the procerus in each corrugator supracilii muscle. We do four injections in the frontalis muscles. We inject each temporal, temporal muscle with 20 units in four locations. We inject the occipitalis muscles in three locations each, and then we inject the semispinalis capitis muscles adjacent astride the median raphe in four sites, two on each side, and the trapezius muscles in three sites, three in each shoulder. Some patients um, uh, benefit from an addition of a masseteric injection, which is easy to do. The uh, vial is a 200 unit vial. So if we add an extra 20 to 25 units in each masseter muscle, then that completes the vial for a patient. And this can decrease the clenching and bruxism and TMJ pain, which can also be a trigger for chronic migraine. Uh, we pass the needle uh, right to the bone to make sure that we are in the muscular compartment and not in the facial compartment so that the facial nerve and musculatures are, are, are not at risk. So um, we, we, and as I mentioned, uh, injection in even non-muscular sites can have profound positive effects. So sometimes if patients get too much soreness from injection of Botox, we just inject the subcute tissues over the muscles if that's a site of pain. Um, so this seems to have a direct action on vanilloid receptors. Um, and, um, and, and some patients with Botox, you don't see full benefit until they've had two to three quarterly injections, which means that they've had enough cycle breaking to break for the central sensitization to wear down. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, the insurance companies will only approve this if three different classes of preventive medications for migraine have failed uh, the individual patient. <clears throat> Let's talk about migraine for just five minutes because uh, migraine, um, concurrent migraine management is essential for decreasing overall pain uh, we know that central sensitization actually lowers pain thresholds, as in allodynia, and if a patient has chronic pain and headache, then treatment of the headache decreases their chronic pain level. So um, many of these patients have a, a concurrent headache, but you don't know if they had pre-existing headache that got worse uh, with the facial pain or the facial pain came on as a manifestation of headache pathophysiology, but it is a vicious cycle that needs to be broken. So uh, we always uh, default toward migraine 
treatment if a history is present or if their chronic symptoms are exacerbated by typical migraine triggers like weather, stress, fatigue, hormones, or other known triggers. So um, the way we think about migraine treatment is that we have a genetically based threshold for migraine. And then we have many different categories of triggers, diet, physiologic triggers, and environmental triggers. These add up in different ways on different days. And when we exceed our threshold, we get migraine um, events, now, whether they're pain or whether they're atypical manifestations of migraine. By using uh, medications to push the threshold higher and by working to decrease triggers, which we have control over, we don't have control over all of them, then we can bring symptoms down effectively below the threshold. And, and we can eliminate any migraine exacerbation of chronic pain the patient may be experiencing. We use nerve blocks to cycle break these chronic migraine patients. So we use not only Botox, but we use nerve blocks and sphenopalatine blocks. And one of the things that we do in the clinic, we call the full Monty. And we actually just anesthetize all of the uh, sensory nerves going to the scalp. Um, uh, and uh, that includes blocking the supratrochlear, the supraorbital, the auricular temporal, and uh, uh, occipital nerve blocks in, a different, in addition to the zygomatico temporal. So this is the way we do the full Monty. We put half a cc and a half a cc in the supratrochlear and supraorbital. We put a half a cc in the zygomatico temporal nerve. We put one and a half cc's into the auricular temporal nerve, which is sometimes difficult to get, even though it seems like it would be easy. It's in front of the root of the helix uh, here. For You have to anesthetize an, a strip uh, about um, one and a half to two centimeters because of its variability in course. And then we make a line from the apex of the auricle to the occipital tubercle. And rather than, and then we just create a dam of three cc's of of our solution um, from one to the one place to the next so that the greater, the lesser, and the third occipital nerves must traverse uh, this dam and we block all three. It's not necessary to get the injection at the site um, uh, very prox proximal. And we re-inject um, as needed. So um, if we need to start preventive medications, then we use medications that are good at um, blocking uh, central activity because they block sodium channels or calcium channels or, um, or uh, serotonin receptors. So tricyclic antidepressants like low-dose nortriptyline is particularly well tolerated and effective in most patients over 50. Under 50, we tend to use propranolol in men and topiramate in women. And um, uh, calcium channel blockers are a good second line for anyone. Uh, so we have to go down the list and in some patients we try all four before we find something that's working. How about surgery for pain? Well, procedures are um, sometimes, if nerve entrapment and compression can cause pain, can eliminating this um, uh, decrease pain? Yes, it can. But um, we have to be very careful if nerve block is the only criteria. Um, we, uh, with these, there are surgeries designed for all of the nerves we uh, talked about, and they're designed to release entrapment, but often they result in numbness because there's no um, uh, entrapment present. There's only transection possible. Uh, de decompression, rather, is not possible. They should be a last resort, only if all medical management has been exhausted. So um, they can be successful. And the problem with this uh, area is that all of the literature comes from plastic surgery and plastic surgeons don't know very much about migraine headache and they haven't maximized medical therapy. Um, they tell patients tell them, oh, I've tried everything and that's good enough for them. So um, there are wide differences of opinion on efficacy and that results in publications like these, a critical evaluation of migraine trigger site deactivation, um, surgical treatment for migraine, time to fight against the knife, and migraine trigger site surgery is all placebo. These are very carefully constructed rebuttals to migraine surgery. So with that in mind, we're gonna talk about some of these compression sites that can exist and ways that we may um, be able to affect them. Th these are things that we should be thinking about. Um, I'm not necessarily promoting their use. But think about the fact that the supraorbital nerve 
passes under the corrugator supracilii muscle and that resection of the muscle in forehead rejuvenation surgery has resulted in a redu reduction in migraine in a lot of patients who had migraine. Uh, the patients, the, that the supraorbital nerve also passes through a foramen. And uh, so uh, we, the foramen, uh, uh, foramenotomy can be potentially effective. Uh, the supratrochlear nerve actually passes through the corrugator muscle and then through the frontalis branches on its way to the skin and can become entrapped here, possibly. Um, so um, how do you do this kind of surgery? You do a sub, um, uh, you, you do use an upper lid incision under the uh, orbicularis oculi muscle. You resect the depressor um, supracilii muscle to identify the um, supraorbital nerve and vessel. You open up the um, corrugator uh, muscle and then um, uh, resect it as well. And then you do your foraminotomy and then you put in a fat pad to add back the bulk you've removed. And that's the way this is done. Uh, some patients uh, also have pain in the area of the zygomaticotemporal nerve and this is identified emerging from the deep temporal fascia out of the muscle in a sense, uh, 17 millimeters lateral and six millimeters uh, superior to the lateral um, uh, canthus. So the plane of dissection is through the subcutaneous tissues to the surface of the muscle and, and the surface of the muscle is covered by the deep temporal fascia. So you make brow incisions, one and a half centimeter, insert your endoscopic visualization devices and identify the nerve emerging from the muscle. And you can try to decompress it by opening the fascia, but more commonly, I think people just cut or avulse it. Um, and uh, endosco this is the endoscopic view and this is the direct view. So um, the occipital nerves um, have, have a complex path through the trapezius and semispinalis capitis muscle through the aponeurosis at the nuchal ridge and also have a complex um, relationship with the occipital artery. And so surgery here is usually done through a midline incision of the nerve as the trapezius aponeurosis is opened, the uh, splenius capitis medial to the nerve is resected, the, uh, um, a portion of the trapezius is removed, and then a, a tunnel dissection is, is uh, created until the artery is identified and the artery is removed. And then special flaps are created before closure. Um, the auriculotemporal nerve is a transverse incision with identification of the neurovascular bundle, a transection of the vessels, and then a transection of the nerve with a long stump, which is then carefully buried within the muscle to avoid neuroma formation before closure. The same procedure is used for the occipital nerve, uh, which is dissected, uh, vessel transected, and then the stump is buried in the muscle to prevent neuroma formation. So in 59 subjects, uh, some patients had itching, some had hair thinning, some had hypersensitivity or hyposensitivity. Uh, patients do get numbness when you transect their nerves. And, um, uh, but uh, there do not seem to have been very many severe complications, but many, uh, according to the headache specialists who see these patients who are still desperate after surgery have had uh, persistent pain. So it's not a cure-all for anyone. It shouldn't be used uh, in anyone who has not had the full medical therapy first. So should we do them? Um, perhaps. Uh, we should consider it, but only if we are going to collaborate with headache specialists or are going to become a headache specialist ourselves. Uh, remember, it took Peter Janetta 20 years to accumulate data and for neurology to accept uh, microvascular decompression for trigeminal neuralgia. And it just took over 20 years data accumulation and a general generational turnover of resistant physicians in neurology before this became a mainstream treatment that has indeed helped um, you know, thousands and thousands of patients. Um, so um, we need to approach this with, um, with caution. So we've reviewed sensory anatomy of the head and face and understand the interconnectedness at the trigeminal nucleus. We understand that there's a phenomena of convergence uh, that amplifies nerve signals and that re results in referred pain. We understand that effaptic transmission occurs at areas of compression 
that central sensory nuclei can become sensitized and that um, every nerve pathology has pathology, pathologic effects that go toward the central nervous system and then also toward the periphery. Uh, we understand the basics of migraine management, including medication, blocks, and Botox. Uh, we know the injection sites for neuroblockade, and we've reviewed some surgical uh, techniques for nerve decompression. Um, so in summary, Nerve blocks can really help your patients with chronic head and facial pain. Uh, you may need to repeat blocks for the, to get the greatest effects. Uh, migraine management combined with this plays a very important role in treatment of these patients. And there may be, there may be a role for surgical management in very, very carefully selected patients. So I um, uh, want to thank you and uh, I want to uh, alert you to the presence of and six and a half hours of free CME provided by the, um, uh, by the, um, and uh, at mycme.com. And then uh, the book, excellent book by James Sun and Erica Peterson on diagnosis and management of head and face pain. So uh, as the Association of Migraine Disorders is the uh, publisher of the Migraine Toolbox. And uh, the migraine surgery, if you want more details, uh, the book is by Baum and Guri on, um, at Cleveland Clinic. So I um, uh, thank you very much. And this is the first year of this course. If you have comments for improvement uh, of the course, we, they will be listened to and much, much appreciated. So thank you very much. Good luck with these patients.